What's going on, Packer fans? Welcome back to the Pack a Day podcast. I am your host, Andy Herman, and joining me is the one and only Rachel Hotmeyer. You can follow her on Twitter at Rachel Hotmeyer. Rachel, you are, I think, around like 8,800 followers. I'm assuming that there's going to be probably about maybe 2,000 people that are watching this. I figure some of those people are already following you, but if everyone that isn't following you already goes out to Twitter right now and goes to at Rachel Hotmeyer and hits the follow button, we can get hashtag Rachel to 10,000 followers. Wow. I, I didn't know this campaign would be started tonight. I'll have to come up with some creative uh, tweets to keep the followers intrigued when, uh, you know, they follow me during a bye week. This is a rough time to start the campaign. I hope you know that. But OK, I'll, I'll come up with some fun content for Wednesday, I guess, to keep the people entertained. All right. If you're listening to this, if you're enjoying Rachel, which I know you are, make sure to go out on Twitter, follow her at Rachel Hotmeyer. But Rachel, there is never, ever, ever a dull moment in Packers land, which is why we do this 365 days a year and cover the Packers on Pack a Day podcast every single day. But we got to start off with two coaches who are interviewing for head coaching jobs, or at least have been requested to interview for head coaching jobs. One we expected in Nathaniel Hackett, who is going to be interviewing with the Jaguars, who has been requested by the Broncos and now has been requested by the Chicago Bears. Not Not ideal. uh... Don't like that. Uh, And then Luke (laughs) Getze, quarterback coach also getting the request from the Denver Broncos. Kudos to the Broncos for making that call and kudos to Luke Getze for getting that opportunity. And it may seem on the surface of like, because the Broncos are interviewing like already like 12 people. It may be like, well, Getze, you know, you don't know. There's only 12 of those interviews ish that are going to take place. And to get one of those interviews is huge and a huge opportunity. And to start getting your name on people's list, because there's like what, seven openings now. So no matter what, that's huge for Getze. But thoughts just initially on Hackett and Getze and them interviewing for potential open positions first before we break down these two very deserving men to be head coaches right um we need to talk about your pronunciation of jaguars i have nothing to say jaguars yeah all right there's a key vowel difference there but if you look at the spelling of the word it's a u and then an a not an i a u and an a jaguars all right, we will move on, please. Well, how do you say Matt Nagy? I got I got yelled at for how I pronounce Matt Nagy too. How do you say Matt Nagy? Matt Nagy. Yeah, you, you, yours is more of an eh, eggy. Mine's Nagy. Matt Nagy. Oh, do we lose Rachel? Uh, what? I thought we lost you for a second. All right, so what, how is yours? Um, yeah, I mine maybe is because when I tend to see those A's my brain goes to a new England accent. I don't have a new England accent shame, but probably better for my career. But when I look at that, I would assume a Matt Nagy over a Matt Nagy. And that that's how some people in the Midwest say like bagels or bag. It's, it's with that, like E I say bagels, bagels. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And it's just bagels. It's bagels. All right. Okay. I'm learning a lot about you tonight. And I don't know if this was stuff I wanted to add to your resume, but let's get going. I'm obviously right. I think is the important thing here. Oh uh, yeah. Right. right. Hack, let's, let's talk, let's talk about Nathaniel Hack and Lou Getzi. Oh, I'm cringing. Um, all right. Andy Herman, obviously right. Let's go with Nathaniel Hackett. <laughs> he is more than deserving of multiple head coaching calls at this point. It's awesome that these three teams are interested in him so far. Wonder if the giants will give him a ring tomorrow. Right. Um, he, he's been getting looks for years now in this past off season. I think he's taken some personal steps to really prepare himself for this chapter in his career, that type of point of personal acceptance of I'm ready to take the next level. Um, again, like LaFleur said, when you have an organization that's been winning for so long and has that level of consistency, it sucks internally, you know, to see that shake up, but you want what's best for your guys. And I really look forward to the day I see Nathaniel Hackett take a head coaching realm, truly. When it comes to Luke Getze, I really admire him. Not that I don't also admire Hackett. He can make me laugh any given day. Luke Getze is incredibly thoughtful and pensive. And I really admire his cadence in terms of the way he leads men and the way I think he could really turn over culture in any place that needed it. Um, I think he is very, very serious about the job. And I would be really excited to see him take on that role, whether that's in this coaching cycle or the next to come, because as we know, this stuff can get contagious. And once you have one coach getting a call that will probably put him in the cycle for the next few years, obviously it is more contagious for white men than it is for black coaches in this league, which is a disservice at the highest level. But 
I'm really excited to see Getsy get looks as well. I think he really deserves it. And I think he'd make an amazing head coach. No, I think both of them would as well. I'm excited to see where both of their, their careers take them. And I, I would be surprised with how many openings there are if Hackett does not get a head coaching job. And v, you know, via that, I would be shocked if Luke Getsy or Adam Stenovich, I, both of them are going to end up as offensive coordinators, in my opinion, this offseason. Now, one of the interesting things about that, and I'd, I'd love your opinion on this as well, I feel like we as a society sometimes promote to the next level because that's like the like the next step, right? Adam Stenovich is one of the single best offensive line coaches, gurus, teachers in the world. How can we not figure out a way to, you know, have him do that, what he's best at and what he's amazing at, and have him continue to promote? And I know there's ways to get him as an assistant head coach and things like that, but it doesn't carry the je ne sais quoi, I'll, you know, if we're doing pronunciations today, uh, it doesn't carry that of uh, an offensive coordinator, uh, you know, obviously head coach, but you end up in these scenarios where somebody who is so good at something that as, as an offensive line coach can no longer do that because in order to promote up and continue to move on with their, you know, the cycle of everything, they need to go be an offensive coordinator. And I'm not saying he might not be a great offensive coordinator, but we lose a lot of amazing people who can develop quarterbacks at the quarterback coach position, offensive line coaches, and so on and so forth, where I think in some ways, it's, it's almost to an extent detrimental to the game. And obviously I want what's best for Stenovic, like whatever he wants to do by all means he should do. But I do feel like there's this weird connotation or like just, it almost strips away what some of these people are absolutely best at. And, and you no longer have these amazing minds coaching and teaching the position that they're best at teaching. Yeah, I totally hear you. And just like, you know, on the field, there are realms in the coaching world where guys like to be the specialists and, and own their position and, and work yeah, at right. that. Not everybody comes into this wanting to be a head coach, just like in any career. Not everybody aspires to be the type A of that. But right. I would wonder if there's a right situation where we see a couple teams in the NFL have assistant head coach and this whatever sort of title. Um, I wonder if there is a situation where whether it's a LeFleur led team or not, where he could be you know, a coordinator and still lead this position group and still have his hands really deep in at least developing their programming and stuff like that. I wonder what type of elements would need to fall in place in order for that perfect position for him. I wonder what the perfect position for him is truly, if that is what he wants, or if this is what he wants right now, and this is him not peaking in a bad way, but, you know, living his life professionally to the fullest. So I'm definitely curious for his personal perspective on that. Yeah, I, I think, again, based on the amount of openings and based on three teams already be interested, uh, being interested in Hackett, I think a hackett gets combo with Hackett as head coach and, and Getsy as offensive coordinator makes a ton of sense. Now, Beautiful. it's going to be really interesting to see what happens it, if and when Hackett gets a job in that offensive coordinator position in Green Bay is open, who do the Packers prioritize, right? Because theoretically, you would think that Hackett is going to want either potentially Stenovich or Getsy as his offensive coordinator to bring along with. So does Green Bay quickly scoop up one of them and say, we want you to stay here. We're going to make you offensive coordinator. If I had to guess, it's just full guess at this point, no, no anything other than that. But I think Stenovich stays and maybe because Matt LaFleur is sort of a pseudo offensive coordinator anyway, and is calling the plays that they move you know, Steno into an offensive coordinator, assistant head coach role, but yep. do have him still focus on the offensive line, move Luke Butkus as an assistant O-line coach into the O-line coach, and then look for a new quarterback coach um, and kind of, you know, figure it out that way. To me, that seems to make a lot more sense in this situation. Now, losing Hackett and Getze would be big. Like there's no two ways about it. Those would be big losses, but I almost feel in a way that losing Stenovich might be bigger um, in what he's able to do with that offensive line, but it'll be really interesting to see almost that arms race. If Hackett does get a job of what sort of happens there between those offensive coordinator positions and other positions on, uh, on uh, Hackett's staff, uh, staff as well, excuse me. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with the the flexibility and how nimble they would have to be. And again, this is where the business can get ugly on the coaching side of right. things where 
a guy leaves and he wants to take his best buddies with him and, or is there loyalty to your former organization to promise you won't do that? There's exactly. all sorts of agreements and situations. Now, in terms of what this type of mobility would mean, I could also see a situation where there is co-offensive coordinators in place if they wanted to split the roles, let's say putting Justin Newton out in, in place. Um, because at the end of the day, they are very high on what he's been able to do in the tight end room. There's also a lot of faith in Ben Sermons and the way he's been able to coach the line of Packers running backs, especially over the last few years, to a much more durable player. So I think there are eyes on offensive coaches at this point that could move into higher responsibilities. But again, it would all hinge on Senevich still having primary control on the offensive line, even if he's taking on larger responsibilities. All right, you're a betting person right now. Senovich, Getze, and Hackett. You don't have to tell me which ones, but how many of the three are back in Green Bay next year? Oh, oh, this is fun. This is fun. Um, Senovich, Getze, Hackett. How many of the three? Mm, that's tough. Mm, this is a really bad game of dominoes. Um, I'm putting you on the spot. Like- can we do like Price is Right style where I guess lower and if I get over, yeah, I lose? You have to be exactly right or or everyone in the comments will drag you forever. I hope everybody in the comments likes my professional clothing today. Um, you know what? I'm going to go with one. I think so too. I don't, think, I don't think there's any way, especially if, if, Hack, if Hackett doesn't go, then, then there's a lot more opportunity to maybe keep two of them. I think a lot of it hinges on if Hackett gets a head coaching job, but if he gets a head coaching job, I don't see exactly. a situation where there's more than one of them back. So exactly. that's gonna it, be all, it all hinges on that. It's really going to be interesting too, to see what transpires in Chicago. Um, it, oh, let me ask you this too, because I think this is an interesting question. You can, you can be head coach of either bears, Jaguars or Broncos, the three teams that want to interview him. Who do you want the head coaching job of? Mm. Mm. Again, and, and this is, again, a, a question that comes down to, just like I said with Senevich, like, what do they personally want? Do they want a rebuild situation? Do they want a team that has its feet under them? Do they want a quarterback and the investment like they have in Jacksonville and being able to rebuild culture? Because I don't think the Bears, I mean, I know they don't have a culture problem there. It's just athletically, you know, getting everybody on the same page and being able to string together wins in Denver. I think they have a lot of talent there. It's just coordinating it well. And then in Jacksonville, you have them ready to turn a page and really build from the dirt up. Um, mm, I wonder what he sees in Trevor Lawrence, if he sees, you know, the potential to go far. Yeah. My concern with Jacksonville is with bulky being there and the fan base already wanting him gone. The ownership has made poor decision after poor decision after poor decision. Like I I feel like Denver is the safest bet. I think so too. Um, I think Chicago would be spicy because think about just how much you've personally invested in this rivalry. Like, could you switch sides? And that happens plenty of times in sports, people on all sides of a sports team, coaching players, staff, creative, you name it go work for different teams and work on different sides of rivalries and you name it. So that would be super interesting if he worked for the bears, but I do think the Broncos is like the safest choice and gets him out in the most vanilla way. All right. One more question for you're, you're a Red Sox fan, right? Am I, am I messing that up? Yeah. Yeah. 2004 was fun. Whatever. Yeah. So let's say you're a red, you're a big Red Sox fan and the Yankees call and offer you their dream job. Your dream job, excuse me. You just me. want to put me through the Johnny Damon hell again because that's what this was. If you if you could, if the, the Yankees call tomorrow and say, Rachel, your dream job is here. We're going to pay you 250000 Would you take the job with the Yankees as a lifelong Red Sox fan? Yeah, I think I would. And I didn't, and I don't even hesitate with that. I don't know why I said, I think, because I'm looking for the right words to explain it to people who this audience is primarily made of, of, of fans of the game, of fans of the Packers. And to me, part of the innate job of being a sports reporter is leaving your fandom behind. You know, I very excitedly covered the Brewers short postseason this year. Um, You know, the Bucks, the Packers, you, you cover this as ethically and truthfully as possible without any consideration to fandom or anything, any, any prior bias, any investment in that. And there are of course plenty of reporters in this industry um, that, that do retain their fandoms. But to me, I was raised not to in this career. And I, and I'm very proud of that and how I carry myself on the job. So for me, 
a job's a job <laughs> and that and that supersedes all fandoms like yeah well i look back on my memories at fenway park very fondly of course am i gonna pick up tickets to a game when i go home of course um you know do i have you know world series big poppy jersey in the back of my closet yeah i do but like you <laughs> know so. that everybody has wonderful cherished memories of sports in their childhood um i'm sure everybody watching this does so to me it, it's the job first and foremost and even if that meant putting on the pinstripes yeah you pay me two hundred fifty thousand dollars. all right so for those listening if you if you could have a dream job with the minnesota vikings would you take it yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna have to say yes if they if the you know if the vikings call tomorrow if they're opening up an analyst position for you no 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 no, 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 no. i said dream job so they're calling and you know spielman's out in minnesota they need a new general manager if they're calling me, I'm sorry, okay, Packer fans, okay. but uh, you're in trouble because I'm the new GM of the Vikings, I guess, but oh. I guess I would have to take it. Um, we'll figure out what to do with Kirk Cousins later. Ugh, yeah. brutal. All right, so uh, we have to address the sort of the, the weird, bizarro elephant in the room with the, the Broncos wanting to interview both Stenovich and Getz, or excuse me, Getzy and Hackett, excuse me. And of course, with the Packers or the Broncos being so linked to Aaron Rodgers the season to go and potentially, you know, all the talk all along is if he's traded, it would potentially be to the Broncos in your mind, in your opinion, does this pass the sniff test of their sniffing around the Packers and Getsy and Hackett to potentially woo an Aaron Rodgers if he decides he does want to be traded? To me, the Broncos interest in Hackett does pass the sniff test, if you will call it, because I've had a lot of, of sources and insight disbar any of that. The rumors that the Broncos were truly interested in Rodgers, to me, you know, based on a season of talks and conversations and following up on that, there was very little truth to that. It was not even close to the contention of other teams potentially in conversations, but just the logistics of it were, were never actually as close as the internet and some, you know, national voices made it out to be. Right. So as crazy as this is in the narrative of the Aaron Rodgers roller coaster, there is no connection. I, and I, well, first of all, I would believe you're reporting no matter what, but I, I tend to agree with that as well. And I just think, they're interviewing a lot of guys and two of the like 12 that are linked to them already have any link to Aaron Rodgers. So yep. I think they're looking for the best head coach. And I don't think any team is bringing in a head coach on a potential that they could tag, tag it with Aaron Rodgers. Right. Yep. I don't think, yep. I don't think the Broncos have anything signed sealed. Too expensive. Yes, exactly. So yeah, I think they're going to go out and find the best possible person to run their team. And if that happens to be gets or hack it, so be it. And they will move forward at that point. But I think they're doing their due diligence on everything. And I think they're very smart and one of the smartest teams to interview both of those individuals for the head coaching job, whether they get it or not. I think interviewing both of them is, is very, very smart from Denver. Yeah, I completely I, agree. Let's move forward to some transactions and just kind of the overall health of this team. I had the opportunity to kind of go over uh, the health a little bit, but I want your take as well. But we also learned that Billy Turner is now off the COVID list, which could potentially open him up to practice later in the week. Matt LaFleur said there was a chance of that in his press conference on Monday. Green Bay did make one other roster move, uh, releasing Adrian Ely from the practice squad. Potentially that could be a spot for Ben Braden if he clears waivers and is able to get back on the practice squad. So all of those things sort of in limbo at the moment, but your thoughts on the health of this team right now and potentially maybe even getting Billy Turner back to practice as well. It would be huge to see him back. You know, I, I think Wednesday being today will be a, a huge day worth of practice. But again, I think LaFleur was smart to, as he said, temper the expectations. Zadarius Smith has not practiced since week one. And you cannot expect that within two weeks, he will be at divisional playing capacity um, in, in terms of playoffs. These games are so important. And Roger said today on Pat McAfee, we're going on a run. You can't just be willy nilly with your players. If you're so set on going on a run and making this the last dance that you envisioned it to be. So I think though, this is a more important week for Jair Alexander because he has been back at practice for weeks on end at this point, it's really time for him to be taking these full speed reps going as hard as possible without of course, risking injury, because ultimately this is the time for him to prove if he's in playing shape or not. And obviously the Packers will welcome all these players back when Whenever they're ready, but the sooner you can get him back to practice at full capacity, they can really start to figure out their corners issue. And it's a good issue, obviously, but like you got to start putting some schemes in place to figure out how you're going to rotate these guys. And I said it to a couple of people last night and I'll say it again. I would love 
to see them use Darnell Savage at the nickel position. He did a lot of snaps of that as an upperclassman at Maryland. And I think that could provide them a lot more flexibility on the outside, maybe rotating in Jair with Stokes. I think that opens up a lot more options for them. Interesting. Say you. What's that? Let's say you. I see. I'm not a savage uh, believer per se. And I, I think here's, here's where I would struggle with that. Cause first of all, if you're moving savage inside, so let's just say, even say hypothetically that that is his best position, which it very well may be. I, I I'm, I might even agree with you on that, but um, let's just say even that is his best position. You're now opening up a spot at safety, which who are you playing there? Are you playing Henry black there more? Are you playing, um, you know, are you playing Vernon Scott or like, who are you playing more at that safety position? And to me, Matt LaFleur has a very strict philosophy of getting his best guys in the field. He talks about it in the old line all the time, but it is certainly not limited to the offensive line. And to me, if you want to get your best guys on the field, that Savage and Amos at safety, I think the interesting question here is can, can Jair play in the slot? And the reason I say that is I know he can play in the slot healthy. There, there's no question about that, but do you want to have his shoulder have potentially take more punishment as somebody who may need to set the edge on a play who may need to blitz on a play who may need to, you know, they run to his side and now he's the guy that has to stop that running back. You know, all of those things are, you're in the much, much greater harm's way as a tackler than you are as an outside boundary corner. So, you know, they, the Packers could even put Jair strictly as the, uh, the strong side corner. So he's furthest away from the ball, right? So there's the, the boundary corner, there's the, the strong side corner for those listening, like y- who's ever furthest away from the ball, you can have that be Jair. So it's much more likely that that dude's just in coverage and not having to support the run as much. So I think that makes a ton of sense to put Jair in that situation. However, then you have to figure out, you know, can Stokes play the slot? I don't, I don't think that that's where you want to necessarily put him. I think you want to keep him on the outside. Can Rizul play in the slot? Maybe. Um, would he be good there? I think so. Uh, but I think that's where they have a lot of things to figure out. But I have no question whatsoever that whoever that is, whether that's even Sullivan or whomever, I think their corners at this point are far stronger than their safeties and taking a, a Savage and putting them in at, at a slot nickel position and then putting a, um, you know, a Vernon Scott or somebody into that role, I think is not necessarily getting your best guys out. Sure. In the game. I hear you. And the safeties has, have really, I think to me, taken the most beating over the last few games, you know, when you're looking at. so at the end of the day, I, I do think Stokes is used best on the outside as well. I do think, you know, it'd be really interesting to see Bruce will take in that slot role. The other, I think the other option too, is you kind of keep things status quo with Douglas and Stokes on the outside and then sort of Sullivan in the slot with Amos and Savage at, at your safeties. And then in obvious pass downs, you bring in Jair in the slot when it's all right, it's third and right. 10, third and eight, third and nine, whatever Jair's in the slot. He's going to yeah. play there. You keep Douglas and Stokes on the outside. He comes in for Sullivan in that situation. And then your dime uh, potentially remains Kevin King, or you can bring Shannon Sullivan in at that point. I think yeah. that gives you more flexibility there. Um, like or you could potentially, um, you could keep uh, Jair on the outside and uh, Stokes on the outside and then Sullivan and, and Douglas in the slot. So there's so many different things yeah. that they could do in that situation. And I, I think it's all fun to think about because there's a lot more combinations and, and more, maybe more importantly, and something that we haven't discussed quite as much is the fact that Green Bay will have the opportunity to match up with who they're playing against. You know, yeah. if it's San Francisco and it's going to be a team that runs the ball a ton, you know, Jair Alexander may not have a huge role in that game. Again, exactly. maybe obvious pass downs, you know, third and longs, things like that. You bring him in, but it might be Douglas and Stokes out on the corner yep. and they may be, you know, more physical corners at that point. Um, if they're playing a team like Brady and, you know, they're going to pass a ton. Yeah. You might play, you know, Jair quite a bit more in that game, but they have the ability to match up with who's playing against them. I absolutely think Green Bay is looking at this entire playoff run with the healthy pieces they have coming back as extremely fragile but variable situational football at the end of the day they have the absolute ability we even saw it in Detroit you know they're rotating guys in on third down situations um keeping guys in the second half so I think that's a real ability for them to be able to control and pace their own guys based on the matchup you know what depending on we see the Rams Cardinals whatever uh, that changes the game and that changes how many snaps they're going to give these guys the limits stuff like that it'll be very interesting I think 
I think it's got to be the biggest question going into the division round is how they integrate all these players that are potentially coming back. Can Bakhtiari play a whole game? How many snaps can Z play, if any? If Billy Turner's ready, do they go with Turner? Do they go uh, with Dennis Kelly, who's been playing fantastic football? Like, there's just like out Dennis Kelly. He really, seriously, like he has been ridiculously stupid good. So, um, I think all these are really fun questions and they have a lot of very difficult questions to answer. And I'm going to be very interested to see how they do it. I think it's all positive, but it is questions. Nonetheless, speaking of positives, I think going into that lions game, we were hoping that with some of the younger players uh, or maybe less experienced players uh, that maybe we would see somebody sort of step up and uh, sort of take maybe not the spotlight, but at least show maybe a little something more than they've had the opportunity to show in the last couple of weeks in, you know, a limited time, Patrick Taylor has kind of been that guy. I'm very excited about what Patrick Taylor brings to the Taylor. He's got a really unique blend of power and a burst and a quick first step. All of it's really fun. And I'm excited to see what you think about how Taylor's performed these last couple of weeks. I think he's really hungry and I think it shows. And I think he's someone that's absolutely been able to take advantage of every opportunity he's been handed. It's not to say like anybody isn't without fault when they're just so like randomly thrown into situations. But at the end of the day, I think, um, I know you had a really great tweet about how it's going to be hard to keep him off, you know, some rosters next year. And I just think he's really shown what he's been able to do in practices throughout the weeks when it's not game playing time. And it's, I've seen improvement in him just from the summer into his game playing situations, for sure. The strength I think he has in the run, he's learning, you know, to, to keep, stay up like AJ Dillon, being able to be behind Dylan and Jones who have <laughs> incredible spine strength, but also just the ability and stamina to stay up and to ward off defenders better. I think is what he's shown some real growth in. Yeah, it's really tough for young running backs to learn how to run behind their pads. They all want to run so upright usually. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and and learning how to run behind your pads is such a a key thing to learn. And you can tell that Patrick Taylor has been working on that. And you can see a huge difference from even earlier, you know, preseason, things like that, training camp to uh, what he has been in these games. I think it's been a major difference. And I think you can just see him getting healthier too. I think that first step looks much quicker than it did uh, earlier in the off season as well. So he looks healthy and let's not forget to me. And, and maybe I'm wrong in this. Had he not got hurt, uh, at, you know, before going in the draft, he would have been a drafted player. In my opinion, yeah. I have no question yeah. about that. He would have been a drafted guy. Green Bay took a flyer on him, basically gave him a red shirt season, knowing he was going to sit out the entire year, made it to the practice squad this year, got his opportunity. And I think I'm really excited to see what he can do moving forward. Uh, Green Bay has got a really fun stable of backs. Hopefully Kylan can come back a hundred, you know, hundred percent sooner rather than later from a tough ACL injury, but as a really fun group of running backs that isn't going to change much in the next year. Absolutely. And it does show the investment Green Bay is willing to take in their running back room at this point. I think a lot of these positions, you can see teams take these differences over time. But again, Green Bay is, you know, when the, you see Jamal Williams out, the way that they are molding these guys and shaping their unique ground game, I think is really important. Awesome. The last thing I wanted to touch base on today was just sort of a shout out to Brian Gutekunst. And I've, I've done this with a very similar topic before, but I feel like it even needs more of a shout out now the way that Dennis Kelly has played at right tackle. Because yeah. let, let's rewind just a little bit and re- recall the fact that Green Bay had little to no resources to put into this last off season. They just didn't have the salary cap space. They all had to sign, you know, back, you know, back of the roster, um, bottom of the barrel, whatever was left in free agency is to, you know, with, without spending much money at all. Right. And yet somehow he finds a way to trade for Corey Bajorquez trade for Randall Cobb hat tip to Aaron Rodgers. On that one. Aaron Rodgers. Exactly. But still involved in that, which, Oh, by the way, helps get that your you know, MVP quarterback back as well. Signs to Vondre Campbell, which we know that. How for a cool that $2 million. Is. Cool. Two mil. Uh, Dennis Kelly, who again, nobody else seemed to want despite him starting ready over a thousand to retire. Snaps. Yeah, exactly. And Green Bay finds a way to get him in at a very minimal deal. Oh, by the way, Razul Douglas off a of practice squad, Whitney Merciless was going to be a big free agent that they got in season. Um, it just, unfortunately he got hurt, but he was going to be, uh, he was going to be their third linebacker with, with Z out. No question about it. And he potentially finds a punt returner in David Moore towards sure. the end of the season. And to a lesser extent, I'm not going to give him a huge hat tip here, but Isaac Yadam, I will say the fact that they were able to trade Josh Jackson, who is now bounced around teams yeah. for a player that has been able to stay on their team as a core specialist player. Now, do you want Yadam out there playing corner? You do not. You definitely do not want that. However, as a but, special teamer, he's been pretty solid. And the fact yeah. that they got something for nothing, they were going to release Josh Jackson anyway. Yeah. 
not completely unnoteworthy either. But the fact that they had next to nothing to play with from a cap standpoint and still come up with a arguably all pro inside linebacker, the steal of the season in Razul Douglas off the practice squad, a starting caliber right tackle in Dennis Kelly, Randall freaking Cobb, a starting punter, and maybe now a punt returner and, of course, special teams guy and would have been their number three edge rusher had he not got hurt. That is insane, 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 insane. So my question for you is when you look at this list, I know you said steal of the season, Russell Douglas. I don't disagree with that. I just, to me, that title goes to Devondre Campbell. But what do you think if Gutekunst, if we had to rank, you know, most impactful, I guess, in terms of 2021 signings and, and how they have truly propelled this team forward, where would you rank them? Campbell, Douglas, Cobb, Kelly, Bojo, and then you were almost the rest. alphabetical there. Yes, I know, right? And then the rest, I mean, Merciless only played like what a game or two. Moore has only played a game and had a couple of punt returns. And I guess the Adam would probably be the next just as a core special teams guy. But I think, I mean, overall, you're, you know, I think you start with Campbell, then Razul, and then Cobb, Kelly, Bojo is how I would rank it. Yeah, I could see that. And again, it's not like special teams isn't a job that needs to be filled, of course. But again, there's I think there's a more of a pipeline of talent for that than, than just a trade. But ultimately, I, I would put Campbell up there as well. I think it's hard to rank the Cobb signing because of the intangible effect of it was so key to bringing Rogers back happy yeah. to play. So I think that that might, that deserve, might be one. <laughs> yeah. Right. Top two, not two, but ultimately I think it's hard to rank that when you just don't know how much went into that behind the scenes. Also how quickly it happened. There was so much personality involved in that move that it really, again, it was general manager Aaron Rodgers. So, um, but, but generally I agree with you. Awesome. I, I think it's a good point. If, if you're taking into the consideration of potentially it was the key to getting Rogers back, then yes, Cobb right. was the biggest, the biggest move of the off season and nothing else right. is even close. I will, I will leave you with this. Both are free agents next year. General manager, Rachel Hotmeyer, you can have either Devondre Campbell or Razul Douglas back at the same contract. I don't know what that number, that magic number is, but either way, it would be the same dollar number. Who do you want back Devondre Campbell or Razul Douglas? Mm, that is really tough. That is really tough. But given, given this means Jair Alexander is not a factor in this situation, so he would be coming back, yeah. I would say Devondre Campbell, because I think the tandem he's been able to grow with Chris Barnes is something that is going to be so hard to replicate when you, even you're moving other players in your system in there. I think that, um, would be really significant. Mm, that is a tough question. Mm. It is. And I'm part of me says you always take the corner over the inside linebacker. It's a more important right. position. I think both of them have played at an incredibly high level. Um, I do feel like there's a still more opportunity for the Cinderella slipper to come off of Rizul than there is on Devondre. So I feel like there's less risk sure. in, in Devondre than there maybe is with Rizul. Um, you also see Eric Stokes growing. And that's the thing, right? Uh, to me, if they lose Douglas, they still have Stokes and Jair. Right. Yep. If they lose Campbell, it's Barnes and a bunch of question marks. And to me, that's right. still not good enough. And we've and seen that situation happen with Campbell out and it is Barnes and a bunch of question marks. And, and how big, how open was the middle of the field without Devondre Campbell in that game? To me, that was the, Wide that open. Was the, yes, that was the ceiling factor. If you have one, you know, one choice between Campbell and Douglas based on that Lions game alone, give me yeah. Campbell. And it's, it's like, it seems like both legitimately like being here and potentially want to be here. Yeah. I just don't think the dollars are going to make sense for both of those things to happen, but I hope I'm wrong. And I hope somehow both of them are back in green Bay. Although that likely means that maybe Devante or Rogers are gone. If both of them are back, the gymnastics that uh, the salary cap gymnastics that Brian Gutekunst is going to have to go through in the off season, I think is advantageous. Uh, and I don't envy him for being in that position, uh, but it's going to make for a lot of fun talk here on the pack a day podcast. But until then we need to get Rachel to 10,000 followers. So hashtag, Follow you just Rachel picked the worst time to probably launch this campaign. No, no, no. It is playoff time. It is. Everyone is all in right now. Everyone is. How do we entice focus. people to follow me? Tweet me, ask me a question. I'll answer it. Yeah, she will. I've seen it. I've seen it done. I've seen it happen. So make sure to follow Rachel on Twitter. Rachel, any final thoughts today? No. Um, you know, now you got me thinking about Devondre Campbell's paycheck for next year. Would he do one year, 5 million? I don't think so. Yeah. What matters to him at this point? Are you trying to cash the bigger paycheck? Do you want some stability? Yeah, I mean, it's the Bobby Portis, right? Like, he could have went and left for more money, but if they went to Bobby champion, Potus to you. That's Bobby Potus. 
Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> if, uh, you know, if they, uh, he could easily got way more money on the open market and he decided to stay with the Bucks and bring that team back together. So, you know, if all of a sudden they win a championship and Douglas and Campbell say, Hey, I'm going all Bobby Portis on this thing. And I want to, you know, I want to get, I'm, I want to stay in green Bay and yep. take less money. Cool. The heck knows. You know, yep. you just, you never know. And it's going to, it's going to be really fun. It's going to be really interesting. I, I can't wait to see this off season is going to be insane. Like we thought yeah. last year's off season was insane. I think this one might be more seriously. It's going to be crazy. There's, there's a lot of crazy off seasons that are going to take place around the NFL. I mean, we already see what's going on in Cleveland, but ultimately I think the Packer, I don't envy the, the Packers books, pe- books, keepers. Um, I, I worked in uh, NHL legal contracting for a bit and I just, the NFL scares me. It really does. It's a lot of info, that's for sure. But we will have you all covered here on Packer Day. So make sure you're subscribed if you're not already. Follow Rachel and make sure to thank Rachel for joining us each and every week. She's the best. Rachel, sure. you are the best. Uh, we will see you in a week and we will be breaking down the, the next opponent, which we will know at that point, which will be a ton of fun. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys the wildcard games. I'll be right back here tomorrow. So I'll talk to you before then. But uh, until next time, and as always, go Pack Go. Have a goodbye week. <laughs>